Hey guys, stay tuned to the end of the episode where I'm going to read one of the iTunes reviews for Fascination Street Podcast. If you've left one, it might be yours. And if you haven't, do it and maybe it will be in the future. I believe that everybody has a story and I'm fascinated to hear them. So come with me as we take a walk down Fascination Street. Hey guys, if you like what I'm doing, click the Amazon banner at the top of the homepage on FascinationStreetPod.com and do all of your shopping through Amazon. Once you click on it and it takes you to Amazon, you can bookmark it or add it to your favorites and you won't have to go to my site each time. It helps me keep the show going and again, thanks for listening. Welcome back Streetwalkers. This episode is with actor David Starzik. David has been acting in television and film for longer than anybody cares to admit, because that might give away his age. You know David from shows like Melissa and Joey, Mad Men, Desperate Housewives, CSI, NYPD Blue, Hot in Cleveland, and probably most importantly, Veronica Mars. In this episode, David and I talk about where he grew up and what got him into acting. We also talk about some of the projects he has had in his career and how he has helped steer his career in different ways. He tells us some really cool stories from the set about working with Mary Tyler Moore and Betty White. Even stories about working with James Spader and Tim Allen. So enjoy, folks. This is my conversation with actor David Starzik. It's a- Welcome to Fascination Street Podcast, David Starzik. How are you doing today, David? I'm doing really well, thank you. I'm, I'm very, very happy to be here. I'm happy that uh, you would deign to give me some minutes of your precious time, too. It's awesome. You're silly, and it thank is you. 100% my pleasure. Thank you for your time. Cool. So, David, I know that you are an African-American from the 1920s. No, wait. I know I am, Yeah. <laughs> That's the beginnings of the jerk, right? I was born a poor black child. <laughs> there <you> that? go. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> sure. So tell me about where you grew up, David. So I grew up in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. It's the second largest city in Mass, about 250,000 people. Here's a little something to start it off with, which is really kind of a miracle and really incredible. So I went to Polish Catholic Grammar School in Indian Orchard. So Indian Orchard is very like... I don't know uh, how Toluca Lake is to L.A., maybe. Okay. Sort of like that. You know, it's, it's a subsidiary of it. It's a part of it. And I went to Polish Catholic Grammar School for eight years, first to eighth grade. And a woman, I'm going to say she's a girl because I knew her when she was a girl. A girl that I went to school with from first to eighth grade in Western Massachusetts, mind you, in Indian Orchard, Massachusetts. She has just been named the president of Warner Brothers. She's the first female president of Warner Brothers. Get out. Isn't that unbelievable? Well, I think it's amazing. It's wow. absolutely incredible. Well, let me ask you this. Yeah. Is there any chance that's going to help you out at all? <laughs> I would imagine. I mean, you know, look, I'll tell you what. How's this? It can't hurt. Uh, she came to my house and had lunch the first weekend she was here, actually. And, uh, you know, it was great to see her. I hadn't seen her. I didn't ask her for anything. I'm just so, I got to say, man, really? All things aside, power, everything, I am so goddamn proud of her. You know, she's had a great career. Her name is Ann Sarnoff. She was the uh, CFO of the WNBA. She was one of the heads of Nickelodeon. Nick at Night was her baby. TV land, you know. I mean, she's just bright and so successful and yet so humble. Not self-effacing, but just humble. And because we grew up the same way. I'm from a very blue-collar, middle-class, blue-collar household. Uh, my dad was a chemical factory worker. Um, he was an electrician. My mom worked for the school department, amongst other jobs. And she, her dad worked various jobs. He was a greenskeeper. He did all kinds of stuff. And her mom worked at Sears. And, you know, she was always the smartest girl and person in our class anyway. So, you know, to see her succeeding on this level is really a treat. You know, outside of anything she might be able to do for me or whatever, you know, that's kind of second fiddle, really, honestly. I'm so proud of her. I can't even, I can't say it enough. Well, that is kick-ass. 
Yeah, it is. How many other studios have ever, if ever, had a woman at the top? That I don't know, but I, you know that's a good question. I think probably wasn't there the woman? Wasn't she the head of Sony when that whole thing with the interview came out? Remember, they uh, somebody hacked it. The Koreans hacked into it, and they had all those emails from that woman. I don't know if she was the head of the studio though. Anne is actually the head of Warner Brothers, and you know she's so humble. I mean, just to give an example of who she is, I said, so, and what's your job? She thought for a minute. She said, well, I, I guess I'm in charge of the whole thing, huh? Yeah, I guess I am. I have Jack Warner's office, and, uh, you know, I'm in charge of movies and television and streaming. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm in charge of the whole thing. Wow. Incredible, right? She has Jack Warner's office? Jack Warner's office. So I said to her, I said, listen, I want to come to Warner Brothers. I want to sit behind Jack Warner's desk before I die. She said, well, you absolutely will. Anytime you want. Sweet. Will you call me? Can I go too? Sure. Why not? Why the hell not? <laughs> hey, thanks, man. Sure. I mean, what the hell, right? Jack Warner's office. I was like, I was just blown away by that. Uh, Warner Brothers is the one in... Burbank. Yeah, yeah over by the smokehouse. Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly right. Yep. Right across the street. Yeah, yeah, I've been on that lot only one time, but it was really cool. Well, you know, Warner Brothers has always been kind of a home away from home for me, too. You know, I've I've worked there a lot. So to have, you know, someone that I grew up with become the president of Warner Brothers after I'd been there for so long. It was really like a nice, I don't know, full circle thing, as it were, you know? As it were. I think that's really cool, especially, you know, nowadays there's nothing but bad news everywhere, and so it's really oh, yeah. nice to hear a piece of good news. Yep, and, you know, the thing is, too, she's a solid citizen, you know? She's really a good person, you know, good, good family person, really smart but also very, very humble and generous and wonderful and warm and, and, you know, and that kind of stuff that just goes a long way. I'm sorry, but it does, you know, and you're right in this day and age when things are just so fucked and you don't have to say that, but in this day and age when everything is so screwy to have somebody who's really good and a good person, you know, show business needs stuff like that. Show business needs people like that. And although, listen, I will say this about what I've done in my life. I mean, you know, I've worked with a lot of people. And in the 122 things that I've done, there's one person that I would not want to work with again. And I won't say her name because in the spring, she drank herself to death. Sort of informed as to why she was the way she was. Oh, ouch. At an early age, man. 44 years old. And she was very difficult. But she's the only one. There is nobody else. I can't. Even people that, you know, I was warned about notoriously before I went to the set. Wonderful. I've had nothing but great experiences. Like Kristen Bell? I heard Kristen Bell's a terrible, terrible person. Kristen Bell is probably... I'm just kidding. <laughs> she is, and you know, one of the things about doing that show is I did it 15 years ago, and to see the people that they've become, uh, all of them, all of them, I knew them when they were kids, to see that they've become these folks is just an amazingly wonderful thing. Now, everybody, he's talking about Veronica Mars, but we're going to get to that in a little bit. I, I sure, sure, jumped sure. off track there being a little bit. Of no, a we're all good. <laughs> a little bit of a joke. A little bit of a joke there. <laughs> so you, you grew up in, in Massachusetts. and Western Mass. Yes, in Western Mass. And when did you know or what drew you to the theater? The theater. Well, let's see. It's a couple of things. I always harbored the idea that I could do it. But I had a very bad stammer as a young man. And so when I was in high school, I auditioned for You Can't Take It With You, which every high school in the world has done once at least. And uh, I got a part of the Russian dance teacher. And I, uh, I demurred, man. I was too nervous. What happened was the guy who played the lead, who did not go on to become an actor, and I was not going to play that part anyway, there had been a talent scout from a university in Florida. So the night we went to see it, my mother and I went to see it. They got up and said, uh, oh, yes, he's so wonderful and so great. And we're going to, you know, we're going to give him a scholarship and blah, blah, blah. And I was sitting out there seething, seething. So uh, when I went to college, in order to make myself look like a more attractive candidate, I put that I had sung in the choir and been in the plays. And of course, that wasn't true. And uh, they kept sending me invitations. Hey, we're going to do this play. Come audition. Hey, we're going to do this play. Come audition. And finally, they were going to do a musical. My dad 
had an amazingly beautiful singing voice, but he had horrible, horrible stage fright and never really sang in public. And if, believe me, if I could sing like my father, I would have been on Broadway a long time ago. But he taught me to sing. We would sing around the house. We'd get out the songbook and he taught, you know, we sing standards together. And, and he taught me how to use my voice. And just so happened, the first thing I went into audition for was the Fantastics. And if you know that play, I was just a dead ringer for El Gallo. And when I went in, I got it. I got the lead. And, um, on, and when I got on stage, I discovered magically, mysteriously, the stammer disappeared. And, you know, and, and of course, as with so many actors, when I got my first laugh, that was the end of that. Really? I, you know, as soon as they, oh, yeah, as soon as they laughed at something I said, I was like, oh, that's it. I'm hooked. <laughs> that's very true with a lot of actors, by the way. People that do it, you get a laugh, and, man, that really does it for you. I have heard that at some with comedians and some with actors, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you know, and I got very fortunate, too, that I, my first director had been a guy who had gone to New York and had something unfortunate happen to him sexually. Nothing overt, just something covert, actually, that he determined if this is what show business is, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do it. And he came back to Springfield and was an actor in the local theater companies and all that stuff. But he was the guy who, as a young man, he encouraged me to go. As a matter of fact, my mother never spoke to him again because of it, because uh, I left town. <laughs> I abandoned ship and left town, and she was, uh, she was none too pleased about that. But it was what it was, so I ended up bouncing around, going to New York, going to Boston, going to London, then back and forth. You know, so it was a lot of, a lot of that. And, uh, you know, luckily I had my, my mom and dad who, you know, were uh, very blue collar, very working class, didn't quite understand what it was I was trying to do, but also was supportive of me to a point anyway. So I was very lucky. I was very fortunate with that also. What did your parents want you to be when you grew up? Uh, home. <laughs> they wanted me, uh, my parents wanted me to be a lawyer. When I was younger, I was very active in democratic politics in my hometown. My dad was a union leader, union official, and that, you know, in turn gave me name recognition. And, you know, I had worked for Governor Dukakis, I had worked for Senator Kennedy, just volunteer stuff, you know, as a young guy. And they came to me actually at one point and said, you know, we'd like to bring you to run for office. And not knowing that politics was going to turn into show business, who knew? Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. I said, no, no, no. You know, I said, I'm, I'm not a governing official. You know, I just don't have any interest in doing that job. And I have too much respect for the people who do it. I'm not going to waste everybody's time. And they, I remember they said to me, no, 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 you don't understand. You have AIDS. You have all kinds of stuff. You know, people come in and tell you how to vote. But I was like, no, 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 no. I'm just, I want to be an actor. You know, now I've acted like a politician many times, so it's worked. But, you know, I never knew it was going to turn into this, which is just a, a joke. But I had the opportunity. They wanted to groom me to run, and I, I didn't want to do it just because I didn't feel like I was actually a governing official. I didn't feel like I would actually do the job as well as somebody that was voted into the office should. So I left Springfield. I went to Boston. I went to New York. I went to London. I went back to Boston. I went to New York. And then that last time I went to New York, I didn't go back. And then I met my wife and we got married 28 years ago and we moved to LA in 1993. How did you meet your wife? Uh, you know, I didn't believe stuff like this happened, but it happened to me. I was a bit of a gadabout. I was a bit of a runaround, as they say. And uh, she had a theater company. And one of my friends was going to direct their production. And he asked me to come in an audition. And I went into the room. And there was a bunch of people there. And then she was behind the table. She was one of the people making the hiring decisions. And when I looked up and saw her, the very first thing that I thought, I'm not kidding you. The very first thing that I thought was, oh, my God, I'm going to marry that girl. But six months later, I did. Many of my friends were like, why are you doing this? Don't do this. She's a nice girl. You're going to hurt her. Or is she pregnant? Come on. Why, why are you getting married so fast? But I just knew. I just knew. You know, I got really lucky. I talked her into it. I still don't know how, but I did. You know, 28 years later, here we are. And I'm still very much in love with her and a couple of kids and, you know, L.A. and career and everything else. And she's still one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen in my life. So it's really, you know, and, and not just outside, but on the inside too. She's really, she's a, she's a beautiful, beautiful girl. And, and I just got really lucky. You know, I just got really, really lucky. Very cool. What did she do with her, um, her production company or her, her playhouse? Oh, uh, well, they, they, they produced plays. They, they, they had a little theater company. They produced plays. Then we came out here and, you know, she's, 
she does a lot of different things. Um, she does commercials now. She's done uh, some commercials, and um, she does theater once in a while, and she's got a health and wellness business that she really is passionate about, and that's really cool. And, uh, you know, so she's sort of got her finger in many, many different pies. And we've been through, I mean, obviously, 28 years, right? We've been through births and deaths and, and crises and happiness and all kinds of stuff. It's been an incredibly wonderful ride. So I guess what I meant was when you guys left New York, did, did she close up shop or did she start a new one in L.A.? Oh, we closed up shop. No, we no, 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 no. She, it was just a small theater company that she had with a bunch of people she was in acting class with. But we we did something that, you know, people in that position don't do, which was she produced a play and they made money. We sold out and we did it. You know, we extended it and it was really a great little piece and but you know by the when we moved here that was the end of that and you know then we we're, we're in a theater company here we're, we're in uh, ensemble studio theater i'm actually doing a play right now down at versus theater on down on pico so uh i'm doing uh true west by sam shepherd which is just an absolute joy sweet absolute joy oh yeah i don't know if you know that play but boy and this is this is a kick-ass production of it i mean i'm playing saul so i'm only on for a couple of scenes it's kind of the way i like to do theater anyway you know, you come on and you have people say, gee, I wish you were in more of it, rather than people saying, gee, you know, I was waiting for you to leave. <laughs> so so it's nice to it's nice to have people want to see more of me, but I'm working with these um these two guys and this older lady and they are just wonderful actors. Wonderful, wonderful actors. And I was asked to fill in at the last minute. They extended the show and the guy that was playing my part couldn't play, couldn't continue. So they were looking around and I just got lucky that a friend of mine recommended me for the part and um, they called and that offered it to me and I came in and, you know, because I do television, I had to work very fast. And, you know, one of the differences of television and everything else is when you do television, you've got to show up and have it. That's it. You don't have it, go home. Yeah, they don't have time or a budget to wait for you to, to get it. No, they don't. They don't. And, and you, and by the way, as an itinerant guest star, the other part of your job is you have to do it right so that just in case there's a problem, the person that is the series regular, they can make mistakes. And it's, uh, that's okay. I, I understand that that's part of the job. I'm not, there's nothing, um, I have nothing covert involved in what I'm saying. I, I just feel like uh, I, I understand what my job is. You know, I've been really lucky. And, and you know, my dad was a blue collar guy. And uh, so was my mom. And, and I told the story of my dad's eulogy. It's, it's really sums him up and really served me well. When I got my first job on television, I did a Aaron Spelling show up in uh, Vancouver. And uh, my dad called him and was over. He said, well, what was it like? How was it? I said, oh, my God, it was great. You know, they flew me up there first class. And then they limo to the thing. And then I went on and the hair and the makeup and the costumes. And then I went into my trailer and then the kid wanted, do I want coffee? And then they said, talent to the set. And I got in the van and my dad said, what? They said, what? I said, they said, talent to the set. And my dad said, is that what you are, David? Your talent? <laughs> and I said, yes, Dad. And he said, huh. He said, um, what about the person who's running the camera? Think they have any ability? And I said, yeah. And he said, how about the person who did your hair and makeup? Think they have any talent? And I said, yeah. He said, well, just remember that and treat everybody that way, okay? Wow. And that sort of sums my dad up in one story. Nice. And it served me well all the way through. It was a, it was a great little piece of advice. Now, not that I wouldn't have done that, but it was just a good reminder. Sure, absolutely. I mean, yeah. somebody's got to keep you grounded with all your success. Well, that's up to my wife, too. And, you know, and, and, and also, I mean, the thing is, you know, I don't really even consider myself to be all that overly successful. I'm just kind of a worker. You know, I just I work when they ask me to work. Anything I get, I'm always happy to do it. I, I got very lucky when I was younger and an older actor told me, now, look, they're going to give you a dime for saying lines. Take the dime, give your agent a penny, give your manager a penny and take the eight cents and go home. That stood me in good stead over the years, you know, just do the work, you know, whatever it is. I mean, I've done everything from big TV dramas to big TV comedies to kids shows. And, and you know, and I still try to keep my hand in doing theater once in a while. It's when my kids were little, I kind of I sort of eschewed it a bit because I was, you know, just concerned about making dough. Sure. Yeah. And I'm, I, you said you had two kids, right? Yeah, I have two boys, almost 23 and almost 20. Uh, my my 22-year-old is uh, a musician, very talented uh, musician. He's actually a good actor, too. Um, he's here in L.A. He's uh, just moving uh, away now. He's going to go to uh, North Hollywood and live with some buddies. He just came back after being for a year in Austin, Texas. 
And uh, my younger guy goes to Fordham in the Bronx, which is very interesting because, you know, he tells us all my in-laws still live on Long Island, you know, and, oh, yeah, I took the end down to the Penn Station. And it's like, it just, he sounds like he's talking about me when I was young. <laughs> so I bet that uh, if your kids are anything like everybody else's kids, they also help keep you grounded because they don't give a shit what your job is. You're still dad. You know, they really don't. It's, it's amazing. We, we I had a funny conversation with, with my younger guy talking about things. And, you know, and I was on television in the lounge at Fordham. And he walked in. He's like, oh, it's my dad. And I'm like, what? It's my father. It's my dad. And they didn't believe him. He's like, well, look it up on IMDb. I mean, it's got the same name. It's, it's my father. And when I talked to him about it, he said, yeah, dad. He said, it's interesting. They're all so impressed. He goes, they don't realize you're, you're really just a plumber, you know? And I said, yeah, you know what? You're absolutely right about that. I really am just a plumber. You know, the only difference is that unless you're on the, the DIY network, you know, the people aren't tuning in to watch the plumber fix your sink. That's right. But really, that's, that's kind of what I am. I'm sort of, a, you know, I'm just a blue collar worker. It just happens to me that that's my job. You know, come on. I grew up in Western Massachusetts. My wife grew up on Long Island. I mean, there was nobody around when I was a kid. If you, the only way you were on television was if you witnessed a car accident, right? So, <laughs> so you know. <laughs> I mean, I still remember the first time I saw a TV camera, actually, at my house when my dad's uh, union went on strike. Uh, they brought in scabs, and somebody threw a brick through the window and hit one of the scabs with the brick. They came, because my dad was vice president of the union at the time, they came to the house, stood outside. Oh, and my dad said, oh, you know, we're going to find out who did it. You know, it's not the way they could do it, blah, 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 blah. And, and it was just really like, wow, how about that? But that's the only way you were on TV. So, you know, but these guys, we watch television. They're like, oh, yeah, look, it's Quincy's dad. Oh, hey, look, you know, it's so-and-so's mother. And that's really what it is. That's really funny. So, like, when yeah. your dad said, really funny. when your dad said, hey, why did you want to be on TV? Did you say, I learned it by watching you, or right? Right? That's hilarious. I know he never did say that to him. <laughs> that's, that's, that's very funny. <laughs> That's very, I, see, I got, I got lucky because when I was in college, I did a play and the guy that I who was, my director, my first director, he had gone to New York and he had had, you know, something happen and he came back and he didn't, you know, do it and he regretted it the rest of his life. And he said, I remember him saying, man, I'll remember it till I'm dead. He said, you don't want to be me. You don't want to be sitting around at 50 years old, looking out the window and wondering, I wonder what would have happened if I had just stuck it out. And he said, don't let that happen. You've got to go try. He said, if you try and it doesn't work, well, you try and it doesn't work. But don't let yourself be caught in a situation where you didn't do what you wanted to do. And that was very good, sound advice, I think, you know, because now that I'm older, I don't know what would have become of me had I stayed in Springfield. I mean, there wasn't anything there for me, really. Of course, the way things have gone, I might have been president. Who knows? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, crush, I'm a better actor than that guy. Yeah, there's still a shot. I mean, you just got to get on a oh god, help us a reality oh, show. No, and then, no, uh, no, 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 no! Oh my god, I even, I, even I don't want me to be president. No, no, God, no. <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> so, when did you know? Because I mean, you know, a lot of people will act here and there or be in plays or be in stage dramas or even go to New York and give it a shot there. But when did you know for sure that this was a sustainable career and that you are actually going to be able to pay your bills? I've got the moment. I don't know about sustainable, knowing it was going to be sustainable. That's not really in the vocabulary as much. I mean, it's, you know, it has been knock wood, but I will tell you the moment that I knew I wasn't going to quit. I don't know if that'll help you. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. Or that'll help answer the question rather. Yes. Many years ago, before you were born, I was cast in a pilot. So I had done a TV show that, was, that later went on to become a thing called Just Legal with Don Johnson and Jay Baruchel that ran for like a year. Jonathan Shapiro from The Blacklist did it. Wonderful writer. Really nice guy. When I was doing that pilot, uh, Mr. Bruckheimer came on the set and stood next to me and I didn't know who, who he was, and, and he, I got done doing something. I came up, he said, boy, that was terrific. And I said, well, thank you very much. And uh, he walked away, and the second AD came up and said, you know, he doesn't usually say anything to anybody. And I said, well, I, okay, why is that such a big deal? 
He said, well, don't you know who that is? I said, no. He said, that's Jerry Bruckheimer. I said, what? He said, that was Jerry Bruckheimer, stupid. So about 10 days later, I was cast in a pilot that was called Close to Home. And that ran for a couple of years. I was a regular and the show got picked up. And at the upfronts in New York, I had friends with whom I went to college who were in sales, media sales. And they said, oh, no, my goodness, uh, you were in the clip on the upfronts, you know. And my agent said, this is it. You know, you're in the clip in the upfront. This is all good. We're ready to go, you know. So I was understandably excited. And uh, two days before they were going to exercise the contract, my agent actually said to me, look, if they were going to go another way, they would have done it by now. So I think this is in the bag. And I said, great. The night before they were going to exercise the contract, somebody at CBS decided that the character had to be 10 years younger. So it was the night before. So the next day, my agent called and said, listen, I'm sorry. Not going to work. This is what happened. We're really sorry. So I sent my wife and my kids out. And I stayed in the house and I cried like I hadn't cried since my father died. I mean, I just lost my noodles, man. I lost it. Because it was a lot of money. It was a big break. I had little kids. It was so hard for me to, to do, you know, anything. And so the next day, the day after, when I sort of, all the dust settled, I had a, what we call in my, where I come from, a come to Jesus moment. I had the come to Jesus moment in the mirror. And I thought, all right, that sucked. Am I really going to put not just myself through this? Am I going to put my family through it? Am I going to ask my wife, my kids? Am I going to drag them through? And the answer was yes. Yes, it was. And I knew. You know, it's sort of like before the Red Sox won the World Series finally. Uh, when they lost to the Yankees in, in 2003, I, I actually had a call with a friend of mine the next day, and he said, we should be proud to be fans of this franchise, man. You know, I'm sorry. They're trying really hard, and someday they'll win, but, you know, they hadn't won in 86 years. So it was that moment where I realized, no, I am a Red Sox fan, and I'm staying. And, of course, the next year they rewarded us all by, by winning, and then done so several times since. But with the acting, I realized that, no, I was not going to – run away. I was not going to run away and hide. I was not going to let it, not only not let it drive me out of the business, but the thing that I did, which I think was smart was it didn't make me bitter. I realized it was just a business decision and there was nothing I could do to stop it. And what was the ointment on the, on the wound, the salve on the wound was later on that summer traveling with my family on Block Island when my in-laws were living on Block Island, I got a call from my agent and they offered me several episodes of the show with Don Johnson and Jay Baruchel, which also happened to be a Jerry Bruckheimer show. And the other show that I was kicked off of was a Jerry Bruckheimer show. And I realized, well, then it wasn't Mr. Bruckheimer and it wasn't anything I had done wrong. They just wanted something different. And so that's really what it came, came down to. When you have that moment where, you know, you've been sorely disappointed and it's been a, not just a big career move, but a big money move, you know, it was, it was a lot of money, and, and I just wouldn't let it drive me out of the business. I just wouldn't. So, you know, I, I was lucky. I think you were lucky, and I think it was a, a very strong, I don't want to say courageous because I think we throw that word around too much lately, but I think it was a very strong morally of you to, you know, to take a second and think, you know, who else am I dragging through this, and is it going to be yep. worth it? And, you know, how can I adjust my attitude so that it doesn't affect them as much? Yep, that's right. That's right. And so that and what also that kids are innocents. They don't know. They don't ask for anything. They don't they don't know what's going on. And and they are completely incumbent upon whatever you do to keep them going, keep them alive, keep them healthy and all that stuff. And, you know, it was a lot of moments of thinking, well, I mean, really. Is this what I'm going to do? Am I really going to do this to my children? Am I really going to do this to my wife? And when the answer came out, that yeah, because I really believe in myself. And look, I'm not Daniel Day-Lewis, but I'm very good. I know how to do my job. I do my job well, and I pride myself on, on my professionalism. Like, for instance, I did Veronica Mars, and I was a series regular. And one of the things that I thought was very important was that I treated everybody, that I made the experience positive for everyone. Nobody walked away from that going, gee, you know, I mean, wouldn't you hate that? Wouldn't you hate to know 
that people, when you walk away from somewhere, they go, geez, thank God that asshole's gone. I mean, you know, nobody wants that, right? But there are people like that. I've been very lucky. I haven't really worked with anybody, uh, like I said, that I wouldn't work with again. But, you know, by the same token, it's, it's a matter of maintaining professionalism, but also understanding that, look, if the gaffer doesn't do his part and the customer doesn't do their part, and I don't do my part, then we don't have the whole. And if we don't have the whole, then there's no reason for anybody to watch. You have respect for everybody's work, everybody's job, everybody's efforts, everybody's talents, because it does take a lot of talent to do this. And also, remember, I grew up in a place where you know, it was very blue collar, but also there was a nobility to it. There's a nobility to working class people that I think we've lost in America. You know, the sacrifices that those people made for their families so that they could get three weeks of paid vacation off a year. They built the country. And, you know, and here, the studios are the factories. So when those guys are going to do a factory job, quote unquote, they come to work at the studio. They learn how to do a job there. And it's, they're all skilled positions and they work hard. You know, I got, when I got here, um, there was an old character actor coming out of Rock and Roll Ralph's on, on Sunset Boulevard. And, he had been in everything, Guys and Dolls, and I Dream of Jeannie, and, you know, you can't even, I mean, everything. Everything I've been, Martin and Lewis from the 50s, I'd just seen the guy in everything my whole life, and I, I've been here for a week. He was coming out, and I went up to him, and I said, sir, I don't want to bother you. I'm really sorry. I've been here for a week. I want to be an actor. I'm terrified. I don't know what to do. And he stopped, very nonplussed at being stopped, and said, two things that I passed along to every actor I've ever met, particularly young ones. He put his bags down, took his cigarette out of his mouth, and said, just remember, kid, you keep 90% of the money for a reason. Well, that's very good advice because a lot of people spend their lives blaming their agents for their career or lack thereof. But you keep 90% of the money for a reason. And the other thing he said was, he said, your job for the rest of your life is to get it right. He said, don't you ever show up on a set and not know what you're supposed to be doing. You be prepared. He said, those people, they were there before you got there. They're going to be there after you go home. They have families, they have animals, they want to go to bed. Don't you ever show up and not be prepared. And he walked away. And that's great. Great advice. I've yet to work with people that did not respect that part of the business. You know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing to think, you know, because that way you're, you're holding everyone's work on the same level. You know, the producers and the directors are not more important than the grips because without the grips, they're not going to get the job done. That's it. So it's, you know, I was really lucky. I passed that along to all the young actors because, you know, when you're a young actor, they sit around and they go, now nah, just remember, it's all about you. It's about you and you and what you're thinking and what you're feeling. No, it's not. It's about the guy sitting in the theater in Wisconsin in the third row who turns to the guy next to him and says, see, if he hadn't gone to the room, he wouldn't have had his head cut off. That's really what it is. What was the name of that actor? Billy, you know what? I want to go look it up. He's worth mentioning. He was in a lot of stuff. You know, he was a very, very good character actor. Had been around forever. He really, really knocked me over with that made me think about it in a completely different way. And actually in a way that like my dad did. Yeah. And no nonsense. That's right. No, that's right. No nonsense. Have respect for your job, have respect for everyone else's job and you'll be, you'll do just fine. And I found that to be the case. The guy's name, by the way, is Danny Dayton, D-A-Y-T-O-N, Danny Dayton. He's around forever. You know, movies with Martin and Lewis, the guy, just everything. Hey, streetwalkers. Here's a word from our sponsors. Let's get back into it. Let's talk about some of the people that you've worked with. And I want you to, since you won't sure. say bad things about them, say something nice about them, about your time with them. Okay. Tell me a story about James Spader. My dad died. I went back to Massachusetts and I buried him. And I got a job on Boston Legal. They called and said, hey, you want to come and do this episode of Boston Legal on Monday? And it was a welcome, welcome respite. It was just great to have that, and I was so fortunate. But when I got to the set, I went into uh, makeup, and I was sitting there, and the makeup person, because I had worked for uh, David Kelly a bunch, I went in, and the woman said, hey, are you, are you okay? What's the matter? And I said, well, you know, the truth is uh, my dad died, and she said, oh, oh, no, that's terrible. And I said, yeah, it's just this past week. And, you know, I'm, uh, I'm okay. You know, I'm here to work. It's okay. I'm fine. And, you know, not knowing that anybody was paying attention to me or anything. And I walked onto the set and just right behind me in my 
ear came this voice, and it was Spader. He's from Massachusetts, too. And he said, hey, listen, I, I overheard what you said, that your dad passed away. I know what that's like. He said, if, if you go through today and you find that you're having a difficult time doing it, you just let me know, and I'll, I'll get them to shoot something else, and you can come back tomorrow. And I was lucky. I was happy to be there. I was just happy to get myself out and do something other than deal with what I had been dealing with for several days. So that's my Spader story. It was nice. But how sweet is that? I think that's very sweet. And oh, yeah. I think that it speaks to one of the reasons of his longevity. If you are an actor, well, actually, if you are able to work in any field successfully for almost 40 years, oh, yeah. then that means that people do want to work with you. There's plenty of opportunity and plenty of other talent. Yep. You know, you can be easily replaced if you're just a dick. That's right. And even right. <laughs> you can even be a dick sometimes, just not all the time. But but more to the point, like he overheard it. I didn't even tell him. He just came up and said, hey, I heard what, you know, what you said. And if you need to get out of here, I got your back. Don't worry. How often does that happen? You know, especially under circumstances like that, they've got a schedule to keep. They've got blah, blah to do. So, you know, that was lovely. But, you know, that's the thing. I've worked with wonderful people, and I, I've just had the fortune of doing that. I've just been really fortunate, man. i, I got to say, I, I find nothing but solid people, um, good actors, good people, really, really nice folks. And, and, and that's really, that's been my experience of Hollywood. As you know, all we hear about is all the rotten shit, right? Oh, that guy's a jerk. Oh, that girl's terrible. Oh, blah, 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 blah. No. That has not been my experience whatsoever. Yeah, I think if you were to ask most Americans, you know, what are the stars really like? I think, particularly right now, they would say, oh, they're all assholes except for Keanu Reeves. Because that's all we ever hear. Because he's a Canadian, right? And when, when was the last time you met an unhappy Canadian? I, I put it up a couple of years ago because I post a lot of political stuff on my various sites and all that gunk. But, you know, one of the things that I put up was... Yeah, here I am with all my Hollywood elite friends at the end of the block watching the fireworks on July 4th. He's feeling like a big elitist, you know? I mean, it's, it's just not true. You know, yeah, certainly there's a lot of people that are insecurities and there's a lot of things that are, you know, can be difficult, but that has not been my experience. My experience has been everybody has been really kind to me, really nice to me, really professional, easy to work with. I haven't really had any, I have nothing bad to say about anyone. There's one person, 122 things that I've done according to IMDb. I, there's one person I would not want to work with again. Well, I think that's a great batting average. Oh, yeah, my God. It's, it's, it's an impressive batting average. Now, you know, I've also discovered that if you know how to do your job, everybody will, everybody steps up and treats you well, too, because you're doing your job. That's a valuable commodity. It's just to know how to work and how to work efficiently and how to work well and how to work right and blah, 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 blah. I love it. Uh, Betty White. Oh, my God. What an unbelievable doll. What an amazing and wonderful woman. I actually had a moment with her that was really fun. I was in the last thing Mary Tyler Moore ever did. And I've been in love with Mary Tyler Moore from the time I was a little kid. I mean, she's a Dick Van Dyke show. and I'm just so in love with her. And she came to work, and I went early. And it just so happened that she and Betty were sitting alone on the stage being interviewed by a young lady with a mini recorder. She was, you know, talking and I waited. And when the young lady left, I, I went up and I said, now, look, uh, Mary, I come over to introduce myself. My name's David Starzik. And uh, I want you to know I've been in love with you since I was a little kid. And I used to fantasize that I would work in show business and my wife would be on, on TV and, you know, it's just be wonderful. And I, uh, I was just wanted to be with you. And I'm, I was afraid that if I came up and introduced myself to you in front of other people, I would make a complete asshole out of myself. So I've come over here to make a complete asshole out of myself in private. And Mary said, well, that's, that's very sweet, David. Thank you for saying that. Don't you have anything nice to say to Betty? And I said, no, I've been working here long enough. I don't have to say anything nice to Betty. <laughs> and Betty said, she said, Mary, um, David is playing Valerie's boyfriend. I was playing Valerie, Valerie Bertinelli's boyfriend, which was also surreal. So David's playing Valerie's boyfriend. And he is a very nice guy and a very good actor, and we're very lucky to have him here. And I had that moment. You know those moments in the movies where, like, your perspective changes, where, it, where they have that thing where, like, the background goes backwards, but everything stays forward? Yes. I had that moment with them where I saw myself 
as a 14 year old kid on the floor of my parents' living room in Massachusetts, watching them on the Mary Tyler Moore show. And now here they were in front of me. And it was just surreal. Betty had to say things in Polish and my, my mother was spoke fluent Polish. So before you could do it with your phone, uh, and this is old school television, by the way, I would call my mother and she would phonetically pronounce the words for me. And then I would, uh, when Betty had to say things in Polish, I was lying on the floor saying the words up at her in Polish and she would just repeat them. They sent my mother more flowers than she could fit on her table. That's the kind of people that they were. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And Betty White was just, she was amazing. Uh, one of my favorite extemporaneous things ever. Uh, when I finally brought my wife to the set, I went up, I said, Betty, I want you to meet my wife. And she, without missing a beat, she looked at me, she goes, you're married? I wouldn't have done that with you if I'd known you were married. It was just fantastic. <laughs> just so, so quick. Right on top of it. That's fantastic. Isn't that great? That's... Yeah, I, I feel like I got a three for one on that. I got Mary Tyler Moore, Betty White, and Valerie Bertinelli. Yep, it's a great story. That is awesome. Yeah, so, you know, yeah, so, yeah, you got a little little Mary, a little Betty. That was a surreal experience. So you got to remember, Valerie and I are the exact same age. So when I was a kid... And she was on one day at a time. You know, I was in love with her when I was a kid. And all of a sudden, here I am, you know, smooching her up. Pretty spectacular. That's going to be the name of this episode. Smooching her up. Smooching her up. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you know, but Valerie, uh, a few weeks ago, celebrated her 100th episode of her cooking show. Yeah, I did know that. I saw that on, on TV. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Talk about another great person. There's somebody who's just phenomenal. Really? Phenomenal, welcoming, bright, effervescent, fun, funny. You know, that whole cast of people. I was so lucky to get that job. Want to hear a great show business story about that gig? Of course. Okay, so I auditioned for the pilot, and they wanted to hire me for the pilot. I don't know if you remember what the show was about, but Hot in Cleveland was about these women who were over 50 and ignored in L.A. You know, nobody pays any attention to them so they they get grounded in uh cleveland their plane goes down as they're on their way to paris and when they get into cleveland they suddenly realize they're the hottest people in cleveland right and everyone's paying attention to them and loving them and you know oh my god they're so hot blah 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 so they decide to stay in cleveland that was the conceit of the show i auditioned to play in the pilot valerie has a one-night stand with a guy so they wanted to hire me and Nickelodeon came back and said, look, it's our first foray of scripted television. You know, he's fine, but we need a name. So they hired John Schneider, which, you know, John's a good fella. Wait, are you talking about Bo Duke? Yes, I am. Okay. So they hired John. So as the show started to go, John did the pilot, and that was it. And then they brought me in to play Valerie's first boyfriend, and I think I did six of them, I think. I can't quite remember. I played a cop. I did either five or six or seven of them. I don't quite recall. But anyway, whatever it was. So I did the episodes. And how I got written off the show was there was a family reunion. And I was bringing Valerie to the family reunion to meet my family because I was going to ask her to marry me. Bonnie Franklin played my mother, which was like, forget it, man. My head was exploding right oh my gosh but how i got written off the show was it turned out john schneider was my brother so the part that i auditioned for in the first place that they didn't hire me for because they wanted somebody who was more of a name ended up getting me kicked off the show anyway that is hilarious isn't that isn't that funny that is show biz you can't make that stuff up that is you hilarious. just can't that's really funny right it is funny tell me about working with joey lawrence on melissa and joey Oh, Joey liked what we were doing so much uh, when I did it that he actually went to the producers and had them give us more stuff. That's happened to me twice. Um, he really liked uh, whatever we were doing. We were playing therapists, I believe. And um, he liked it so much that he went to the producers and said, hey, you know what, these guys should have more. So they, he got us another sequence. And what I knew about Joey, too, was that I had heard this when I was there. He had had a stand-in. And uh, for some reason, they didn't invite the stand-in back when they came back. And Joey went in and said, look, uh, bring the stand-in back or, or else. Um, because didn't want the guy to lose his job. The guy had a family, and he was very in tune with that, and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, so 
you know, that's, that's, it's a good thing. That was fun because there was a, there was an electrician on that show. That's a good friend of mine. That's a friend of a friend. And I got to work on the show and he was there and that was really cool to kind of sort of share the, share the stage with him. That was really kind of cool. Very nice. I loved that show. I never missed an episode. I loved that show. Oh my God. He was amazing. I actually, the other time that happened to me was a real boon. I got a job on uh, home improvement. I think it was six lines. And my first son was just been born. And I was walking off the Disney lot and my pager went off. How about that? And it was my agent. And I said, okay, you know, call your agent. So I called and my agent said, all right, now look, they want you to do it. We don't want you to do it. And I said, well, why not? She said, well, we think it's too small. We want you to do bigger things. And I said, well, okay, I'll tell you what, here's how we're going to play this then. Uh, how much are they paying? I think it was 1500 bucks or something. And they're 1500 bucks. And I said, okay, you send me $1,500, see, and I'll send you back 150 bucks and I'll send 150 bucks to the manager. And then we can, uh, you know, and then you can make the uh, contribution to the, um, to the uh, health plan. And, uh, you know, on the same token, you can, uh, you know, pay me the residuals when the thing reruns and I won't do it. I'll stay home. I won't do it. And she said, oh, my God, you really have to do it that badly? And I said, yeah, I've got a baby. Of course I have to do it that badly. Yes. She said, all right, we'll go ahead and do it. So I went in the next day, and it turned out that that year it was the Halloween episode, which was their biggest episode of the season. So I don't know if you've ever been to a table read of a sitcom, but when you go to the, the table read, the network table read, everybody and their brother is there. So I went in and there was, you know, 70 people. And because it was the Halloween episode, it was even more. It was just ridiculously full. And we read through it. And Tim was producing at the time. And I didn't know him at all. And he started giving notes at the end. Okay, I like this. I don't like that. I want this to be a little different, blah, blah, blah. Well, what, that, that joke didn't work. And then he said, and this guy, and he pointed at me. And I froze, man. I was like, oh, no. He said, this guy is very good. I want him to have more stuff tomorrow. So... The next day, when I went back, it went from six lines to six scenes, and it was the biggest episode of that year, and it put me on the map. I got hired for sitcoms after that like crazy, and it was just such a boon. It was so wonderful. You see, usually when you do a sitcom, it goes from, you know, six scenes to three lines. They rework it and hone it, and the jokes don't work, or you don't tell the joke right, or whatever it is. It's the only time in my career that my part got bigger rather than smaller. And that was all due to him. And then after that, I got, because you know, the thing is too, when, you, when you're an actor, they see you in a certain light. You're a sitcom actor, you're a whatever you are. And I've done a bunch of dramas, but I also could do comedy. I had done a lot of comedic theater. I'd done Shakespeare and Chekhov and whatever and blah, blah, blah. And you know, I don't really look like your typical comic. And that was back in the days when, when you were a stand-up comic, they were giving people shows because they were stand-ups you know so many people got their own shows right and so i did not uh, fit the prototypical mode but tim allen helped me to be seen differently you know by a lot of people in town a lot a lot of people in town now for those who might not remember how big of a star tim allen i mean he's still a huge star but back yeah. when uh home improvement was on oh it was the biggest show on tv he had the number one television show, the number one movie, and the number one book all at the yep. same time. Yep, yep, sure did. And, you know, another testament to a, a guy who is a work withable, he still has a huge show. And this, and that was 20 years ago you're talking about. Yep, sure am. I'll just, yep, yep. It's really funny, you know, having done that and seen him, it really made a big, big difference for me. I mean, he sort of put me on the map. I did a bunch of sitcoms that year after that. So it was very, very cool. That's kick-ass. So what did your agent end up saying? They loved it. They actually came down to visit me. They came down to the set to see me. <laughs> I'm sure they enjoyed getting paid on all of the subsequent shows that stemmed from that. Oh, yeah, sure. It turned out to be a really, really good choice. And, you know, look, we all got to work, right? But that's that's a good one. That reminds me of a story. I'm friends with Clint Howard. and. A long time ago, you know, he, he was offered this role and he wasn't really sure if he should do it. So he went to talk to his father. His father, for those who don't know, is Rance Howard. Rance he Howard. was an actor for about 60 years. He was yes, an actor. he was. 
And he took that script to his dad and he said, Dad, I really don't know if I should do this. You know, it's it's not a big, huge role, but I kind of really want to do it anyway, but I'm afraid it'll hurt my career. And his dad said, listen, son, is that movie going to get made with or without you? And he said, well, yeah, Dad. I mean, that's not hinging on me. And he said, so if you don't feel like it's going to hurt your career and you want to do it, why wouldn't you get paid? Somebody else is going to get paid to do it. Why wouldn't you do it? You're damn right. Older actors told me years ago all that stuff about, you know, just do it. Just do it and shut up. Yeah. I think that's awesome. And and I love I love the old school actors and they're and you know, back to that no nonsense. Yeah. I mean, this is a job. Do your job and then go home. Do your job in such a manner that everybody else can also do their job and go home. That's right. And do your job in such a manner that the next time they your name comes up they go, Oh yeah you know, rather than oh no, no 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 no, no not him. Exactly. Anybody but that guy. Well, David Oh, real quick, if you want to listen to a really good interview, yeah. I was the last person to interview Rance Howard before he passed away. Really? Yes. Oh, I bet that's cool. Yes. And it was in his living room in the same house that he raised those boys, and he was the nicest guy. Oh, my God. How cool is that? It was very cool. So you should check that episode out. That's excellent. Now, David, before I let you go, can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media? D Starzik, D S T A R Z Y K, is my Twitter handle and my Instagram. I'm on Facebook. You know, I'm pretty open about accepting people's friends' requests. I learned years ago that when people stop asking for stuff, then they're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> people ask you for things, you're doing something right. Now, how long are you going to be in True West? Until September the 28th. Are you here in town? No, I'm in San Antonio. Oh, I was going to say, if you wanted to come, uh, I would get you comp tickets, but I will be in True West till September 28th. Um, it's a great show. Uh, it's in a very small theater. Only holds 33 people, but the guys that I'm working with are doing a bang up job. They're just doing a wonderful job, these young guys. Where is it? Where can they find tickets? It's Versus Theater Company. It's on Pico between Hauser and Carmona. Versus Theater Company, True West. I'm just playing Saul. It's not, I'm in two scenes. I really like, prefer to do theater like that, you know, and, you know, but the guys that are doing it are remarkable. If anybody's in LA and they want to see a real, true, great piece of theater, they need to come see this because it's really, I, I, I'm not saying it because I'm in it. I'm saying I'm, I'm lucky to be in it. Very cool. Yep. Well, David, thank you so much. Oh, before I let you go, is, is there anything that we didn't talk about or that I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about? Is there any stories that I wanted to tell that I haven't told? Are you in the Veronica Mars thing that's about to come out? Oh, yeah. I'm in, I'm in six of the eight. Oh, yeah. Oh, kick ass. And I've just uh, aired an episode of The Affair, too. Nice. Very cool. So, yeah, uh, episode, uh, episode two of season five. Awesome. So tune in and have a look at that, folks. All right. Well, listen, man, I really appreciate you giving me your time, too. Thank you so much. It's very, very wonderful. I really, really appreciate it. It was an honor and a pleasure to speak with you, David. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. I, I, I'll take that to heart. I'll take that as a compliment as it's, it's intended to be because I, I, I value that. So thank you. Well, again, thank you. And thank you, David, for letting all of us get to know you a little bit better on Fascination Street. Absolutely. And thanks very much for your time. If you ever want to talk to me again, I'm always around. Well, we have each other's phone numbers, so that might actually happen. <laughs> yeah, we do. You have a great rest of your day, and I hope your son feels better. Yes, I hope he does, too. I made it for chicken soup, so hopefully that's going to chase away the blues. That ought to do it. All right, young man. Thanks. Behave yourself. Yeah, <laughs> no way. Bye. <laughs> Bye. This is an iTunes review for Fascination Street Podcast. This review is from NYC Pod Guy. It says, Very cool. Very cool concept. Excited to see what's next. Thanks, NYC Pod Guy. That was a five star iTunes review for Fascination Street Podcast. Rate and review Fascination Street Podcast on iTunes, and maybe next week I'll read your review.
Hey, streetwalkers. Well, you're not literally streetwalkers. But now that I've got your attention, I am Stephen O'Reilly, and I have a podcast called The Bar Star Podcast. And since you're listening to the Fascination Street Podcast, I think you should check out my show. It's just as interesting without all the famous people, because Steve has connections that I just do not have. But if you dig podcasts about music, working musicians, and other random shit that I decided to talk about, based around music, of course, because that's what I do, I'm a working musician for the past 30 years, then you need to check out the Bar Star Podcast. You can get it wherever you get your podcast, on any platform, and make sure you check out Bar Star Podcast. Dot com. Now back to the one and only Steve Owens and whatever the hell he was talking about. As always, thanks for listening, Streetwalkers. And don't forget, follow the show on Twitter at FascinationSTPD, on Instagram at FascinationStreetPod. Follow the podcast page on Facebook at Fascination Street Podcast. And of course, you can always email me at fascinationstreetpod at gmail.com. And if you haven't already, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button and rate us on iTunes. For the next three months, everybody who rates and reviews the show and sends a screenshot to fascinationstreetpod at gmail.com will get a free surprise gift mailed to them, every single one of you. So do it. Thanks, Streetwalkers. Opening music is the song Magnolia from the 2014 album Intransigence. Used with permission from Douglas Miles Clark. Closing music is Apollo from the 2001 album Into the Known by the band Sapphire. Thanks for hanging out with us and getting to know a little bit about our guest. We'll see you next time on Fascination Street. 